This painting is called Copper Teapot with Bullet Hole. I read a story that Ned Kelly had shot a hole in a copper teapot he used when he was out in the bush on open fires. So here is this relic he's left behind, its purpose obsolete three times over. Ned Kelly's initial breaking of it, me then submerging it, and the fish utterly unaware of its mythology and use. This painting is called A Little Splash, and it is a, an homage to Hockney's painting, A Bigger Splash, which in itself is an echo of a motif that is always present in my own work, that which we leave behind. The splash from the original painting only exists because of the absence of that person, and the splash is also a rare opportunity to paint something so visually abstract for a figurative or a realist artist. I also found a lovely similarity in the shape of the vase protruding up through the water and those of the original palm trees um, protruding into the sky. This painting is called The Old Man Band. And when I saw this mandolin on a shelf in an antique shop, it was filthy with age and patina and history. I spent way too much time bringing back that shine in a way destroying the story its patina told. Hemingway was of his time, and his writing punchy and exciting, his ideas bold and very masculine. But does his work still hold relevance in a time that embraces a different outlook on so much of what were considered masculine virtues? Hemingway doesn't care. He continues to play his tunes with his band of other old men. This painting is called I'd Rather Drown. There was a, a degree of guilt in repurposing other artists' iconic imagery from my own paintings. But with Liechtenstein, I did it gleefully, as he was such a wonderful plagiarist himself. I'm also aware that true history vessels are often used to represent women, and wrapping a man's stolen painting of a simplified woman's face around a representational female in the vessel is intentional in only so much as it is subliminal. The text, however, is very intentionally cut and submerged at that point, and I needed to change the composition of the original painting to make it work. I also changed the name and the text from Brad to Roy, as though calling to him for help, or maybe permission, to use his imagery. Would I rather drown than call Roy? Probably not. This painting is called This Too Shall Pass. There is a very bad and beloved old children's joke. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. I've switched seven and eight around to appease the fears of six. And as such appeasement is a bad idea, making the clock no longer as functional as it was. The truly terrifying return of populism in the West uh, feels fearsome foreboding. The alarm bells are ringing. But I take heart in the wisdom of history, specifically sic semper tyrannis, or thus always tyrants, words attributed to Brutus after the murder of arch-populist Julius Caesar, and the title of the painting, This Too Shall Pass, words deemed always true by wise King Solomon, or in other words, the passage of time tick-tocks past us and shall render useless all we do, say, think, feel, and hope. So, hooray for that, I guess. This painting is called The Water Dance. I love Matisse and I love the deceptively complex simplicity of his work. I love the elegance of his work, but I especially love his painting, Il Dance. As a child, I thought those figures were floating or dancing in water and they lent themselves to getting wrapped around a vessel. It is, I hope, a deceptively simple painting and a very genuine love letter to Matisse. This painting is called The Absence of a Figure by a Pool. In the original David Hockney painting, uh, Two Figures by a Pool, uh, it only existed by a happenstance of two photographs in Hockney's studio, his model swimming in the pool and a friend standing on his own. I've removed that second figure and replaced it with a fish. It changes the meaning, I think, and. The alienness of a figure underwater intruding into the domain of the fish somehow becomes even more surreal once it's submerged again. And finally, Hockney, a British painter, is wrapped around that most quintessentially British object, a teapot. 
This painting is called Schrodinger's Wave Function, and it's about the absence of people. The fishermen from the original Hokusai print are removed. The ocean continues on without us, and the fish just don't care. All that remains are what we leave behind, in this case a vessel in the Hokusai print. Schrodinger was a physicist who helped formalize quantum mechanics and was instrumental in the shaping of the uncertainty principle and the observer effect. If there's no one there to see it, did it even happen? This painting is called Ireland circa 1977, and it's about the Ireland at the time I was born, which was, of course, 1977, and the future it seemed to face. On the one hand, which is the dark, black, or I suppose bad camera, was a very clear violence of the north, uh, which is a splash of red paint across the camera that dominated the news at the time and I guess the news is represented by the flash you know shining a light on what was happening on the other hand the white or rainbow or happy or good camera I suppose was the Irish state's relationship with the Catholic Church which is the bishop piece and the appalling relation the church had with children which is the pawn piece in their care and of course it was much less visible the absence of a flash This painting is called Panacea and Persuasion. When I was growing up, Jane Austen was one of the few female writers we studied at school. She was held up as a panacea to the very correct accusations that her education system was too male-dominated and oriented. Separately, as much evidenced by the recent mechanic, beware those selling a cure to all your ills, whether actual or metaphorical, in an attempt to persuade you of an idea panacea and persuasion and finally something about using the image of a man to sell the work of um, one of the greatest novelists ever who you know happens to be a woman uh, had a, a sort of a humorous appeal to it I suppose this painting is called the feather crested warhol and is a companion piece to an old idea, no longer dangerous in a fake gilded cage, another work I have here in this exhibition. So much of Warhol's work is now behind bars in the vaults of collectors all over the world. And there's something intrinsically sad about that. And so too, there's something very melancholic about bird cages, caging the freedom of flight, caging an image that wants to be seen. However, the the genius and I suppose the paradox of the ideas within Warhol's work remains free. In this case, bird soup only makes sense as a metaphor because it is caged. This painting is called An Old Idea, No Longer Dangerous in a Fake Gilded Cage. The Catcher in the Rye is one of the most banned books of the 20th century and it continues to be regarded as one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. Its depiction of the teenage years is widely cited as one of the most accurate committed to the page. So we put this great work, like so many others, in a golden cage, preserved for all time to be admired by all. But the strength and power of those ideas has faded. The cage is fake gold, not real gold. The ideas that resonated with those older generations no longer have the same impact. Old ideas in fake gilded cages. This painting is called Love and Kisses, Andy Warhol. Towards the end of his career, Warhol placed an ad in a magazine called The Village Voice. It said, I'll endorse with my name any of the following. Clothing, ACDC, cigarettes, small tapes, sound equipment, rock and roll records, anything, film and film equipment, food, helium, whips, money, love and kisses, Andy Warhol, EL59941. It is conjectured that he was making a wry commentary on the accusations that he was a sellout. And I can see him in his studio waiting for his bright red telephone so he to ring so he can do a deal with Campbell's Soup. Or so the story goes. I don't remember it well. It's all telephone soup to me. Besides... That's only the second greatest fear of the artist. Am I a sellout? Commercially, let's hope so. Morally, let's hope not. This painting is called Long Live the King. 
the Queen is dead. And it is about the death of Queen Elizabeth II and the coronation of her son, Charles III. The absurdity and wealth of the British monarchy is here represented in the reflection of the English teapot. And of course, the tea acts as a metaphor for the colonial wealth amassed by the British Empire through their um, conquest of so much of the world. This painting is called The Tower of Blabble. According to neuroscience, and I have no reason not to believe it, the act of recalling a specific memory inherently diminishes the accuracy of that memory. We use placeholders for our memories. And here, the redhead matches are a placeholder for someone early in my life, a redhead. But now all I have is this collapsing memory of that person, imperfect, imprecise, broken. Hence, the matchboxes are all missing their most important part, the striker for those matches. And any indication that those boxes are full of matches is also absent. This painting is called Damaged Vessel. What is real? A picture on a jug? The original painting? Has a missile punctured a hole in the jug? Will a toy fire contain the flames? Don't ask me. I don't know anything.